Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Julie Stern on Visible Learning for Social Studies, Designing Student Learning for Conceptual Understanding. Thanks for joining us. First off, we at Corin wish health and well being to all of you, your families, and your communities. In times like these, experience has taught us that one of the best ways to combat isolation is to remain connected. We are so happy that you took the time to join us today for some professional development. Just to let you know, if you have questions for Julie, please write them in the chat function in Zoom. Please don't send them to Q&A, but please send them to chat. Ask them when you think of them, and we will answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Upcoming webinars. May 4th, Beth, Beth Cobit and Karen Karp, Strength-Based Mathematics Instruction. May 11th, Benji Howard and Wade Antonio Caldwell, Youth Equity Stewardship. Yes, May 18th, Debbie Diller. Simply Stations, Grade 4. What does the rest of the class do during small groups? And June 1, Brian Goodwin, Building a Curious School. Now what I'd like to do is turn the presentation over to Eliza Erickson, editor for Teaching Essentials for Corwin, to introduce today's presenter. Hi, everyone. I am honored to introduce you to our presenter, Julie Stern, today. Julie is an internationally recognized teacher trainer, keynote speaker, curriculum designer, and author. She partners with schools around the world to build students' conceptual understanding so they can transfer their learning beyond the school walls and be empowered to address real-world problems. Her books, Tools for Teaching Conceptual Understanding, Elementary and Secondary, are visible learning supporting resources that are the perfect answer for teachers wondering, how do I move my students from surface to deep levels of understanding? Or, how do I teach for transfer? Julie holds a strong background in teaching social studies. Not only is she a James Madison Constitutional Fellow, but she has taught nearly every course, including ancient history, world history, American history, American government, sociology, psychology, and geography. Julie's work with surface, deep, and transfer levels of learning and her extensive experience in the field of social studies made her the perfect co-author of Visible Learning for Social Studies which she wrote alongside John Hattie, Doug Fisher, and Nancy Fry. The book will publish tomorrow, and we couldn't be more excited for Julie to join us today to share some insight around how you can make social studies learning visible in your classroom. We will be raffling off three copies of the new book, Visible Learning for Social Studies, to three participants in the chat. So make sure you're sending in your questions in the chat function and stick around until the end of the webinar for a chance to win a copy of the new book. Without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Julie. Sure, thank you so much, Eliza. So uh, hello, hello, good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. I went ahead and turned on my video. So um, if you want to be able to see me, I think probably the best view is to click the one in the middle. So there's the middle one, if you don't wanna see me, minimize me. Um, and then the one in the middle is like a one square and that way you'll be able to see who's speaking, um, and, and that way you can see me if you'd like. So here's our agenda. What are we going to be doing today? So I want to give you a very brief introduction to visible learning. In case you're not familiar with the work of John Hattie, that's what this is all centered around. I'll give you a very brief introduction to it. And then I want to talk uh, briefly about social studies learning made visible. How do we make social, social studies learning visible? to us and to our students. And then we'll go through the three phases of learning. That's how all of the books in the practice series are organized, surface, deep, and transfer. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit briefly about assessment strategies. So that's our agenda for our time together. And I've also set up some success criteria. So this is my hope for you. Um, by the end of this webinar, my hope is that you will be able to do these things. I can make social studies learning visible in my classroom. I can select and implement instructional strategies that match the specific phase of learning, surface, deep, and transfer. I can pick my favorite strategies and say, you know what, this belongs in the deep level or this belongs in the surface level. And then finally, I can measure the impact of my instruction on student learning. That's, that's my main hope for you all for, for our time together. And so there's a lot of people on and I'll have other people monitoring the chat features and Q&A and things like that. So I'll have time at the end um, where I'll open it up for, for questions. 
so please feel free to put up your, your questions as we're going along and I'll just save them for the end. So first I wanna just hear from you guys and we're gonna put up a poll. What are you hoping to learn in today's webinar? Are you hoping to learn ways to make social studies more exciting for students? Are you hoping to learn how to make student learning visible in social studies? Are you hoping to find strategies that help students become informed citizens? Or is there another reason? Is there something else maybe you wanna type into the comments? And so a poll will pop up hopefully, and you'll be able to select. So if you want to participate, go ahead and select. I'm just curious, where are we? Um, I see the answers coming in to what you guys are most sort of interested in. Wow, cool. I'm seeing a lot of people, I don't want to reveal it, but you're selecting one of mine. I was afraid everybody was going to be other and then we wouldn't have time to read um, all of the comments, but that so far is only 6% is the other. Somebody, you guys are selecting um, A, B, or C for the most part. Let's see, almost there. I just want to make sure everybody has a chance to vote before I um, let you know. This is great because I think a lot of people, I'm so, so, so passionate about social studies. I do work with teachers across grade levels and across subject areas, but social studies is my heart. And I'm so, so, so excited for this book to come out. I think it's going to be something that's really gonna have an impact on teaching and learning and on the civic health of, of our countries. Um, and so it looks like the number one answer is um, how to make student learning visible in social studies. So that to me indicates that probably a lot of you are familiar with visible learning and you probably joined this webinar um, knowing that uh, this was about John Hattie's work. Um, some of you, many of you said to make social studies more exciting um, and strategies to help students become more informed citizens. Also, those are, those are close um, next ones there. So um, great, we're gonna do all of those things. And so um, I, I was just curious to see where you guys are. I think if we do this well, that students will become better informed citizens and social studies will be more exciting for them. And so if you're not familiar um, with the work of John Hattie, John Hattie uh, published a vis official visible learning books. And then in 2016, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry co-authored with him visible learning for literacy. And then um, after that visible learning for mathematics came out and then after that visible learning for science came out. And so I was so honored to be uh, the co-author that selected as the um, content area expert for visible learning for social studies. So this is the latest book um, that launches tomorrow. So uh, all of the slides here are based on, on what's in that book. So 30 second overview of John Hattie's work. He's a statistician and what he looks at is meta analyses, which is basically studies of studies about what works or what, what sort of impacts student learning. And so he's very interested in what, which things, some things have a negative effect um, and that's over there in the red. Some things actually um, have kids unlearn. They sort of forget what it was that they, what they learned. Um, and then some things have, you know, they have an effect like developmental effects or, or sort of teacher effects. And then what he looked at was of all the studies on student achievement, 0.4 is the average. So he says we can think of it as roughly a year's worth of growth. If all the things that have an impact on student learning is a 0.4, if the average is a 0.4, then what are the things that are above um, 0.4? If things are 0.8, that's, that has the potential to double our impact on student learning. If things are a 1.2, that has the impact to triple, that has the potential, excuse me, to triple our impact on student learning. And so um, all of the books, the Visible Learning Practice Series, look at those particular effect sizes and say, what are those things um, that really have an impact. If you're interested in the research, I really encourage you to see this free website. It's called, it's just the website is visiblelearningmetax.com. And you can go there and you can click and read every single study that John Hattie is using in his analysis. And so it's almost impossible to read them all, to read them really, really thoroughly, but um, I've read them for the ones that I'm going to share with you all tonight. Um, and so I, I really wanted to also let Doug Fisher give a, a short intro and welcome to everybody. So because he, he and I worked very closely on this book, um, he's been an amazing mentor to me. So I asked him to say a few words um, to you all as social studies teachers. So here's, here's Doug sharing for us. Hello, History Social Studies teachers. I'm Doug Fisher. Thanks for joining the webinar tonight. Julie is going to lead you through an interesting conversation about making history, social studies visible to students. 
And whether you teach government or civics or social studies or history or geography, all those amazing concepts that students desperately need to learn, regardless of the subject you teach, this is going to be a conversation about how you take students from the surface too deep to transfer, where they use the information you provide them to make informed decisions and take action in the world. I hope you're gonna enjoy this seminar, I did. I think it's an amazing way to get kids learning more than facts, but how to use the information that you know so well. Thank you again for your time and thank you for making the world just a better place with kids knowing about the history. So uh, thanks to Doug for that, that intro. And I really loved how he talks about the potential that we have for our kids. If we do this well, what can happen? Because uh, in my opinion, and I think it's, it's, it's based on research such as the Stanford History Education Group, we have a crisis in civic literacy right now in the United States and many other democracies around the world. Um, and we know as social studies teachers, we were power, people are passionate about social studies. We know that the facts are very important. We also know that it's, it's Social studies is about skillful application of these disciplinary skills. We want our kids to put whatever it is that we're studying in context. They need to know what happened first, what happened second, what happened third. They need to know where in the world is this occurring and, and when in time did this occur. We also want students to analyze primary sources. We want them to know the difference between primary and secondary sources and what's the information that they can give us. We want students to understand that perspective has a huge role in social studies and they need to recognize bias, including their own. So how do we take this enormous task of making social studies learning visible to our students and making sure that our students are really informed um, citizens in a democracy? That's, you know, our super <clears throat> important takeaway that we hope you all will, will take from this book. So I'm going to use this what's happening with, with COVID-19 as almost like a way to think aloud, not about this because I'm not an expert on, on viruses, um, but I wanna use this as a think aloud to help you look at this triangle of surface to deep to transfer of learning. Because I think this is a great example of what's happening right now of how we have to go through each of these phases. Often we think of surface level learning as like a bad word, but it's not. Surface level learning is critical. For example, how many of you, you can uh, let me know in the chat box or, or otherwise, how many of you had to learn the term social distancing about four or five, six weeks ago? We had to learn what that term meant. What does that mean? So I, I know social, I know distancing, but I got to put those two together. Um, and so I see a lot of you saying, me, me, raise your hand. Um, in, in learn the, the infection curve. What is the curve? Um, we had to learn what that means. Um, what is an infection curve? Respiratory transmission, the difference between um, certain diseases that are communicative, but also respiratory and how serious that is when it's a respiratory transmission. All of those words for me personally were somewhat uh, new for me. I had to acquire that understanding. And once you acquire sort of these vocabulary words, then you can start putting them together. And that's when you can can get to deeper levels of learning. So we're all asking ourselves, how does social distancing impact the infection curve? We're asking ourselves, what effects does a decrease in the curve have on social distancing? Does that mean we see a decrease, we can all run back and, and go back to concerts and, and things like that? Is that, that what that means? And so one of the situations when we're getting to transfer, the, one of the first situations that we faced, I celebrate both Easter and Passover in my family, was can we get together for Easter and Passover? That's a transfer task. Okay, I've got my um, understanding and my surface level understanding of these words. I'm doing deeper when I put them into relationship. And now I need to sort of apply them in unique situations. So Easter and Passover happened. Um, and now I'm thinking about summer vacation. How many of you think about, okay, wait, when am I scheduled to go on a summer vacation? Am I going to be able to do that? Um, and then we start thinking about the start of next school year. Okay, when does our school year start? Am, based on what I understand, am I going to be able to do that? So that's just a real quick think aloud using the current sort of topic of how we go through surface to deep to transfer. And what we want to do is take our students 
through that process when it comes to social studies. And one thing I'm really passionate about is the role of concepts in each of these levels, concepts in surface, concepts interacting in deep, and concepts sort of transferring to new situations. And so here's just a quick example for, for geography. Let's take a grade six geography. Imagine a teacher has a bunch of images up of an oil rig, maybe um, an open pit mine, maybe um, a huge lake with a hydroelectric dam connected to it. And students, sixth grade students are discussing what do these pictures have in common? And you might have some students who say, oh, they're natural resources. Okay, so give me more. Give me more about what's, maybe you've heard the term natural resources before, but what about these three pictures tells me that they're all examples of natural resources and really pull out for our students what the criteria is for that concept. And so here's just a quick, I'm going to use this grade six geography example in surface deep and transfer just to have one that kind of goes throughout. So surface would be acquiring our understanding of natural resources. Maybe we're also acquiring our understanding of the concept of power. I feel like that is one of those huge concepts that's almost every social studies situation we wanna ask ourselves, where's power in this situation? Scarcity, when we're talking about natural resources, we can talk about scarcity. And then finally, even source analysis, even those skills, we can do surface level learning strategies to introduce this idea to our students. Teacher modeling is a great example of how we can do source analysis. I can model for my students how I would go about looking at a source around these concepts. And so then we get to deep when we start asking about how does power impact situations where natural resources are scarce? I'm looking to connect those concepts in relationship. How does power impact situations where natural resources are scarce? And then maybe we look in at the Nile River context. We're looking at this question and how these concepts interplay in the Nile River, and then we transfer to a new situation such as the Tigris River. So I'll keep coming back to this, but concepts play a role throughout. And so here's some quick definitions of each of these. Surface level learning is when students gain initial understanding of the concepts, terms, skills, facts, and vocabulary of a topic, when we introduce these sort of as isolated bits. And then, Deep learning happens when students begin to make connections between these ideas and they start to generalize about broader principles based on their classroom experiences. And then finally, we get to transfer when students start to apply these connections to new situations. So a couple different examples that I want to give you for surface. The other thing I want to emphasize is that students are increasing in independence as they go along this triangle. So they're gaining initial understanding, they're starting to make connections, and we want them to be increasing the independence and their ability to transfer their understanding to new situations. And so here's a quick grade one example. I want to go across the grade level so that you guys don't and nobody feels left out. Imagine a grade one teacher gives students a bunch of pictures of actual people from their school. Here's a picture of our librarian. Here's a picture of our basketball coach. Here's a picture of our bus driver. And here's a picture of our cafeteria worker. What do all these things have in common? And this could be a way that the teacher can introduce the concepts of roles and responsibilities, which is very common in grade one um, standards documents and learning outcomes documents. So that'd be a way to introduce the concept of roles and responsibilities. And they use all of these pe people that the students already know accessing their prior knowledge to get them to sort of think about, ooh, they all have different roles. And those different roles have these corresponding responsibilities to sort of understand what those two concepts are. And then the teacher is going to make sure that they understand those and we can consolidate that understanding through a cooperative learning strategy such as Jigsaw. He would maybe give different um, groups. Maybe some groups are have the teammate as a role and they have friend as a role and maybe have they have student as a role and maybe sibling as a role and students have to discuss among themselves a description they have to come up with a description of the role and the responsibility for each of these expert groups and then they jigsaw to other groups to sort of talk about it the effect size for jigsaw is 1.20 it is the is one of the few strategies that goes across surface to deep to transfer so I'm going to talk about it again when we get to transfer and so that is a super super powerful strategy so here's quick examples of how we want to organize our facts into concepts I think for social studies, this is essential. George Washington or Cleopatra, those are, if those are in your learning outcomes, make sure you teach them alongside these organizing concepts. Here's just some ideas, either leadership or government or authority. All of those are key social studies concepts. Maybe you have to teach the Amazon River and the Himalayan mountains. Maybe your students just need to know major features around the world. Teach it in the context of the concept of natural features or natural resources. 
Maybe you have to teach Mayans, Aztecs, Incas. These could be indigenous peoples, ancient civilizations, cultures, societies. All of those are examples of these more organizing concepts. And finally, World War II or the Cold War. Maybe you have to teach these pieces, these uh, moments in history. This is about war. It's about international conflicts. It's about alliances, for example. Um, but really think about your, whatever it is you have to teach in terms of these organizing concepts. Why? Because these these facts are harder to transfer when we've got them as organizing concepts it becomes a lot more easy a lot easier to facilitate transfer and so in the book we've got some um, learning intentions for this one you can see it's about roles and responsibilities for kindergarten for grade five it's about profits and sellers and how profits influence sellers for grade seven, it's about, it's about the, the spice trading and the Asian roots, but it's about trade roots. That's the organizing concept that we can go from situation to situation. And in, in, in grade 11, the example that we use is religious intolerance. So all of those examples have a concept that's sort of gonna, gonna be able to help to organize our learning. So some of the strategies we use, if you're familiar with my work in my workshops, you know that I love this SEEI model and we changed it to the see it model, thanks to Jeff Phillips, um, from the International School Manila, which is to get students to talk about it. So it's a way to get students to really consolidate their understanding of individual words. You can see that student's example of services there. What we're doing is this is a vocabulary program which has a 0.63 effect size. And then when they talk about it with the partner, you're bringing in class discussion, which has a 0.82 effect size. That is the potential to double our impact if we teach and use classroom discussion. So we can do that um, when students start to consolidate their understanding. Here's an example of note-taking. Um, teacher Leah McGray out of Forsyth County, Georgia. The student, she taught them Cornell notes. And so the student had to make the summary and come up with the, the key points and the cues from her, her notes. And so the effect size for note-taking is 0.51. So it's another strategy that we talk about um, in the book. And we go through each of these and we explain them really well. What about space practice? We do want students to know some stuff with automaticity, and that's usually towards the end of surface level learning. Look, guys, I just need you to know some of these dates automatically. So that can happen. Uh, one of my, my teachers, Krista Ferraro, she has students time themselves. See how many dates you could properly put in order um, on this blank timeline. And so space practice doing that um, over time, not all at once, but spacing it out has a 0.65 effect size. So all of these are amazing ways that we can help students to really acquire that initial understanding and start to consolidate that initial understanding in surface level learning. So here's some of the strategies with the page numbers in case you want to watch this again. Um, you can press pause once you receive the recording and sort of think about um, which strategies you might want to use. So moving into deep. So again, surface level learning with our geography example would be natural resources, power, scarcity students acquiring and consolidating their understanding of those particular concepts and looking at the facts in order to understand what those concepts are and then we get to deep when we start saying okay you know what power means you know what natural resources mean how does power impact situations where natural resources are scarce and we go really deeply into one context in this example that i love to use we look at the nile river and so that would be an example of a context we do for deep and so the other thing I want to emphasize here that's along the side is that metacognition is key. We need students to be aware of their learning and the amount of metacognition um, increases as we move from surface to deep. So a lot of the strategies um, for deeper levels are really about students monitoring their own learning. So classroom discussions, we have in the book some sample conversation markers um, from grade one, the example, how are roles and responsibilities different? How do roles and responsibilities work together? You could use those questions to lead a classroom discussion about roles and responsibilities. Again, that classroom discussion, 0.82 effect size. So grade 10 history example from Christopher Ferraro, how do we account for the development of both freedom and oppression in 19th century America? And so this is an example of her students, they've already read quite a bit about reconstruction. They've read their textbook, I should say, about reconstruction. And so this is an example of one of those pieces that's hard history. We call it hard history, hard history that's hard to teach. So often what teachers tend to do is slavery is hard to teach, so I'm not going to teach it. We don't advocate for that. We advocate for you to put those questions in front of students, bring them some primary sources and some secondary sources, have them analyze those, and then use those to have their conversation. The teacher can stay neutral. 
but facilitate that conversation with your students and don't skim over these hard history, the things that are hard. And so in this case, Krista, what she did was she had them select the most important events following the Civil War. So select the most important events following the Civil War. Graphic organizers are super powerful when they're in deep learning. We want to make sure that students have acquired some surface level understanding and then they can start to use the graphic organizer and they put what they think is most important in there. We don't want the students to copy our graphic organizer. That's not deep learning. But when they can select the most important dates um, and events that happen during Reconstruction, that's when they're doing deeper learning. They're thinking about it deeply. And so Krista asked this question, and then she had them read uh, this article, Liberty is Land and Slaves, The Great Contradiction. And so this is out of um, the, um, a, a magazine, a historical uh, society magazine. She had them read this article, and then she had them go back and reread their chapter about Reconstruction in the textbook. So this is the textbook that she was using. Go back and reread. And so what that's doing is questioning and what it also is doing is metacognition. Reread and monitor your thinking about the text, the, the textbook now that you've read this article. So it's again, this metacognition, we have some self-questioning instructions in, um, in the book so they can help you really, really do these strategies well. And we also have a website evaluation tool. We know, um, we've included some of the resources from Stanford History Education Group. We know that the majority of middle school students in this study were unable to tell the difference between a news story online and an advertisement online, the vast majority. Um, and so we've got some things in there about um, analyzing sources on, on the internet. And then finally, the last strategy I want to share for deep learning is feedback, but not just any kind of feedback. Self-regulatory feedback is what's powerful at the deeper levels of learning in that um, it's about the conditional knowledge that's, that students need to do. It's that self-monitoring. So the example that we have in here is to a student, we could say, when you got frustrated with your group, you moved your chair back and took a breather. Then you rejoined them a minute or two later and your group completed, completed the task. Why did that work for you? How were you different after you rejoined them? And so that's a great example of self-regulatory feedback that we're giving to our students. And that's what's really powerful when we get to the deeper learning phase. And so here's a bunch of strategies for deep levels of learning um, that we, they, these are only some of the ones that we have in the book, but what we go through is each one of these, we give examples and we give um, very concrete explanations of how to do this well. And so I just um, let you guys have a, a quick look at that. I highlighted many of these very briefly um, in the webinar and then we'll move to transfer. So again, continuing with our geography example, I wanna to get to transfer. So surface would be acquiring those initial understanding of natural resources, power, um, scarcity, and even source analysis. Deep is when they're practicing source analysis, they're looking at different sources about the Nile River, and they're asking themselves in this situation, how does power impact um, the situations where natural resources are scarce and they're, they're really consolidating that understanding and they're using the facts from the Nile River to really sort of draw out those patterns of thought and that's what's able to transfer. So then they go on to transfer to another situation where resources are scarce and there's sort of this power dynamic such as the Tigris River. And so that's an example of how we could get to transfer levels of learning. And so again that independence is key in moving from surface to deep to transfer and the metacognition is key in moving to surface to deep to transfer. So what we wanna do, um, and it's, it can happen even as young as we have a kindergarten example in there, grade one, and even I'm gonna share with you guys grade two um, from Michelle DiMarzio out of Baltimore. Uh, she wanted her grade two students to understand four different countries and the culture of those countries in Africa. So what she did was she relied on the jigsaw method. So the first thing that she did was make sure that students in surface, she made her sure her students understood what is culture. Let's stop and really make sure we understand what is culture and really dissect that concept. And by the time they got to transfer, what they did was she assigned each group one of the countries. 
and they really studied that country and they came up together what sort of what are we going to share about the culture of this country then they jigsawed to mix groups to share about each country and then finally they returned to their expert groups to discuss the similarities and differences they heard and when they came to their back to their original groups that's when they're transferring because they're listening they listened to all of their ones in their in their expert group so that's four different countries and they came back to their original group they're studying they're talking about the similarities and the differences between those countries. So it's a great example of transfer even at grade two. And so for Krista Ferraro, for our world um, American history example, she was studying the concepts of freedom and oppression. They were looking at reconstruction and then she transferred this whole concept and the whole idea is to two other time periods very chronologically. So it was not, or, you know, sort of at the same time what's happening. So we don't have to totally revamp the way that we teach, but they were looking at the California gold rush and also, and of course, westward expansion and saying, where's freedom and oppression showing up here? Does the same relationship that we saw in reconstruction apply here? Are there different ways that it's showing up here? How can we refine our thinking? So it's a, an example of transfer. Similarities and differences, having our students transfer and analyze similarities and differences, 1.32 effect size. It's off the charts. And so the next thing that Christopher had our students do was have a debate. So a discussion is more free form. We see it more in the deeper levels of learning. But when we get to a debate, it's a formal class discussion where we have, you know, first proposition speaker, second proposition speaker, first opposition speaker, second opposition speaker, and students really prepare for their debates. Um, that's called a formal class discussion is a 0.85 effect size. Huge effect on student learning. What they're also doing when they're getting to this phase is they're transforming their conceptual knowledge, which has a 0.85 effect size as well. So super, super, super powerful strategies if we do this well in our classrooms imagine what school can be. And so here's the examples that I shared with you guys and a couple new ones for transfer level. We get our students to identify similarities and differences. We get them to read across documents. We do the jigsaw method, debates or formal class discussion, and then we'll talk about extended writing. And it's not until this level. So often I felt so frustrated with my, before I learned about the visible learning research, research, I felt so frustrated with the quality of my students writing. Now I'm like, Mm, the kids are knocking it out of the park because I'm taking them surface. I'm taking them deep. I'm very intentional about the instructional strategies so that they really can write um, once I get to that level of transfer. And so a little bit about assessments. So what we are hoping for is making learning visible and making social studies learning visible. We mean to the students, not only to us as teachers, but to the students. And so we have some sample assessments in there where students can sort of self assess. Where are you in the learning journey? We want the students to own their learning. By the time they get to transfer, they should know exactly where they are in the learning journey, what they need to work on, what they need to um, get better at. And so here's just a quick, we, we strongly encourage, um, chapter five of our book is looking at other things that, that really have an impact on student learning and student growth is calculating an effect size. It is, it's time consuming, but it is the only real way for us to see the impact of our instruction. Why? And I'm going to give you a quick example. But what we do is we have to give students a, a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. And we take those two numbers and we apply this formula in order to calculate that effect size. And so we walk you through it in there and we've got on the website, we've got some um, Excel sheets that you can go to and you can plug them in. Um, but I have this quick example here. Shout out to our teacher, Rebecca West and, and her instructional coach, Vince Bustamante in Canada. They actually did this. So these are their students. Of course, maybe some of the names and faces have been changed, but um, look at this. So what we can tell, let's just take, for example, um, let's take, Aaron F. Aaron scored a two out of 10 on the pre-assessment and she scored a four out of 10 on the post-assessment. The old me would have said, God, what a bummer. I mean, she still doesn't get it. And I would have been really upset, but look at the effect size. It's a 0.93 effect size. Aaron doubled her score. And so it shows us growth. And let's maybe look at um, Burton A. He's got a seven on the pre-assessment and a seven on the post-assessment. He's had zero growth. And so this is a way for us to say, wait a second. And I, I, I screenshotted this, so I, I cut off the bottom, but there was a kid who actually had negative. And you have to say, what? And there's a great little passage where Rebecca has this great reflection where she said, 
what happened with that kid? And she said, you know what? I was doing more class discussion and he kind of checked out and he actually had a negative um, effect on his learning. So she has realized, wow, when we switch to more independent learning, there's some kids you got to stay on them because when you sort of let go of the reins, there are certain kids who they're like, well, she's not checking up on me. Um, I'm going to take a back seat. And so that's a great example of when we calculate those effect sizes, we can really see which kids are moving and which kids are not and really think about what we do next. And here's the absolute sort of coup d'etat here is we have ideas for what you should do next. So of your students, even the student who had uh, Aaron F who had the incredible growth, she's still doing a four out of 10. So there's still something we need to, we need to be concerned there. And so what we use is a uh, different tools that we have in there for RTI response to intervention. And so there's the different tiers and we have specific strategies where we go through what you can do, who's in charge of it, when is it gonna happen, to really make sure none of those students fall through the cracks. And so this I think is a really powerful way to show the amount of equity that can happen if we do visible learning really well. We can keep an eye on all of our students and we can use RTI, look at this, a 1.09 effect size, massive amount of effect size on our students who need it the most. And that's really what we're thinking about, hopefully most of us right now during this online environment. The last thing that I want to share is this from John Hattie, we have included in there, is mind frames for teachers. You know, sometimes when I first started coming across visible learning research many years ago, people saw it as like this top 10 hit list, you know, like, oh, make sure you do feedback because that's in the top 10. Oh, make sure you do this because that's in the top 10. In. And it's really, it's much more than that. And, and when you get to know John Hattie, you get to hear him speak, um, you realize that it's much more than this sort of hit list. And so he, ha he does have a top 10, which is our mind frames as teachers. And so I would love to encourage you guys to read through this list and to think about which of these things, maybe put in the chat, which of these things do you do well? Do you use dialogue instead of monologue? Do you set challenge high for students? Do you talk about the learning versus talking about the teaching? Do you see learning as hard work and encourage your students to see learning as hard work? I love this one. Number seven, assessment is feedback to me about me. Wow, how powerful is that? It's not about the kids and what they know and that they don't know, but how well and what I'm doing, how well is what I'm doing working or not working? And so these are sort of the mind frames that Hattie encourages us to adopt. If we're truly gonna become visible learners, we have to do all of these things. Um, we have to see ourselves as a change agent. We have the potential to combat poverty. We have the potential to combat this epidemic that we're going through right now if we do this well, if we think about our students, think about the stage of the learning journey that we're in, and we select carefully these high yield strategies and we use them well. I, for one, was one of those people who's not necessarily using a jigsaw method appropriately or a close reading strategy appropriately or a reciprocal teaching strategy appropriately until I came across a lot of this work and I started to say, okay, this is how you do it. And so that's all I have for you guys. I want to save some time for questions, um, open up the floor, and hopefully, Jeff, you are monitoring um, what people are saying. I see like, I see 745 chats, so I can't possibly <laughs> tell that, um, but hopefully uh, you're able to monitor those and maybe, and maybe give us a couple of questions. Sure, I've been doing that. So here you go, here's one. I wonder if you can share some strategies for ELL students that would, uh, that would work with what you just presented today. That's a great question. I love that. I think ELL students, when I opened and started, started surface level learning with images, um, that's one thing that I love to do is, is a great way. Anybody who can see can access images. So it doesn't matter if they don't speak the language, doesn't matter if they've heard the term natural resources or power or scarcity or whatever it is. When we open with visuals, it allows our students to use sort of their own language to sort of access what it is here. And I think the, the power of this that I've seen with my own students, I, my, my own kids are bilingual and, and they go to a school where they're language learners. Um, I myself am a language learner in the, in the places where I live. And what I've seen is that when we shift also to a focus on metacognition and really getting our students to um, 
to monitor their thinking and monitor where they are and students and teachers to really assess students so they can see where which kids might be falling through the cracks, then it's a very powerful strategy. And so a lot of all the stuff that you guys know, whoever asked that question, I imagine you know more than me about um, speech to text technology, about different uh, translate tools and apps that you might use. I, you know, all of those things are applicable. We want to do, um, you can do classroom discussions that are, of course, in their own native language. You can do classroom discussions that are written where students can be using translating tools to have those classroom discussions. We don't want language to be a barrier, like, oh, they can't, they can't speak English, so we're not gonna do classroom discussions. No way. I think we need to find ways to have students who are learning the language access this very rich instructional strategy, such as classroom discussions. Terrific. You know, this came up quite a bit. This, uh, this next question uh, is focused on the state is changing the world history course in grades nine through 12 to cover content from 1200 to the present, but they have now organized the content by concept. Mm -hmm. The goal is to move away from chronological teaching to concept teaching. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions on how what you presented today would support making this shift without completely confusing students? And that came up quite a bit today, this idea okay. of so teaching can... history uh, conceptually. First, I want to make a clarification that I think it's a misunderstanding that people think chronological is not conceptual. So Christopher Iro teaches conceptual and she teaches chronological. I teach chronological and conceptual. So I just want to say that, first of all, that you can teach conceptual and you can still go up in order um, of when things happened. I think regardless, what I do in my classroom is I've got, even if I'm teaching geography or I'm teaching American studies or something that's not history, I've got a huge timeline around my classroom. And I, we put major dates on there so that it's a visual for students to see where they can kind of keep going back to that. Because I'm teaching, we've got a lot of strategies in there about contextualization. Guys, first thing is, when did this happen? What happened right, right before it? What happened right after it? And so you can use that sort of timeline in the classroom as a way to anchor um, what it is you're teaching and allows, we all kind of go in and out of history. We, 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 didn't we don't necessarily think when we're thinking about coronavirus, for example, Wuhan was a word I had to learn. I didn't know that, um, but I know something about China. I know something about Asia. I've kind of put it into this contextualization. And so what I do is use this visual across the classroom that you can kind of keep those major dates in mind and you can kind of keep adding to it so that students are still anchored in when things happened and you can still put things in in context um, and what happened right before it, what happened what was going on in that region at the time um, so I still encourage even if you don't go chronologically still timelines are important to the, the idea of con contextualization and making sure that our students are, are looking at what happened and, and what happened sort of around that thing that we're studying. Terrific, thank you. For sure. Are, are you writing, as a teacher, are you the one writing the deep questions or do you write them with the class, you and the class together, or do you have the students write deep questions? Do you teach them how to do it? That's a great question. Um, I think it could be one of those things that scaffolded. Maybe I start off by asking out the asking the questions. Maybe then we do it together, and maybe then they start writing their own. And you do start to see when you start to teach this way intentionally. What are concepts? How do we organize those concepts? How do we look at the relationships between them? That's when we're building scheme in our brain. That's when we're building expertise. Then the students start to do it on their own. Even if you didn't ask them to, they're going to start to do it on their own. So I think it's a it's a process that happens very naturally really to really have students own those questions. I think at first I, I provide some. Terrific, thank you. What is the best high yield strategy we can use with very young students, kindergarten and grade one? Uh, well, I would say even kindergarten grade when I have a kindergartner at home, you wanna think about surface to deep to transfer. And so we have that example of roles and responsibilities throughout the book because we wanted to make sure that you see um, you have to take even kindergartners from surface to deep to transfer. And we want our, there's, they can think more abstractly than we give them credit for. There's been research to show that. And so I think it's really important. Um, I mean, I, you know, my favorites, I guess, are uh, with my own kids is sort of what is this concept and make them sort of see what it is in their world to make them sort of identify what that concept is in their world. Look at different examples like roles and responsibilities. What are your roles? You're a brother, you're a cousin, you're a best 
best friend, um, you're a son, you know, all of those things, I think um, making them connect to their prior knowledge and really acquire that understanding of the concepts. And then, you know, really some of those, those wide reading strategies by getting your, your, even your young kids to look at picture books, to look at images from around the world, to look at this same idea in multiple situations. Uh, we talk in the book about going to the librarian to say, look, these are the concepts we're studying right now. Can you pull all the picture books that you have for those concepts? And we put them sort of in piles and let the students explore the, pie, the sort of tables where there are different concepts and they do wide reading, which is a strategy um, also that, that really helps students to, to consolidate their understanding. Sorry, that was a lot more than one. <laughs> that was excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, is the surface learning to deep learning transfer hierarchy an adaptation of Bloom's taxonomy? Is it similar to that? How do they compare to each other? That's a good question. That's a decent question. Um, I have, sh I sh you know, it is similar in the sense that, so Bloom's taxonomy, first of all, I just want to make sure we know that there's the ways, the cognitive process, which we think about, um, basically remember all the way up to synthesize or analyze or create or evaluate. Um, there's also the, the knowledge dimension, which is um, factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, procedural knowledge, and metacognitive knowledge. And so that, that dimension is often left out when we talk about, um, talk about the revised Bloom's taxonomy. And so I think when you, you can take those, it's a simpler table. Um, and so that's kind of why I like it, surface to deep to transfer, but you can think about it as students sort of um, remembering and um, understanding is is surface and when they start sort of evaluating analyzing um, you could think about it like that as getting to to the higher orders and I think that's a nice way to think about people often look at that creates which is at the top of, of blooms to say oh I mean, my kids are creating a poster no it has to be a new situation or a really new to the world um, idea that the students are creating in order to reach that higher level. And so I think that that transfer is a great way to make sure we are reaching that higher level of blooms. Thank you. Uh, what techniques do you use to move from groups to teams to achieve that ownership of learning that we're looking for? That's a great question. I think once I'm making, I'm monitoring all along the way, and I think that's the key to making learning visible is that we're monitoring and the students are monitoring. Do you understand what scarcity is? No? Okay, let's review that. Um, do you understand what natural resources is? No? Okay, because we can't get to deeper levels of learning until you can really articulate what the individual concepts are. And so once students are privy to this is how the brain learns, this is how we go about learning, we're going to monitor our thinking, we're going to set our own goals then they start to take ownership of it. And so when we start to see, do you understand what this is or do you need a little bit more time on this? That self-assessment I shared, um, that really can transform the ownership in the classroom for students to say, no, I don't. Often classroom management issues become, are, are that because either the kids are bored and they, it's not challenging enough or because they don't understand and so they can't access it. And so what I found is when I'm intentional about it and I'm constantly monitoring, I want my students to monitor themselves, then the classroom management issues go down because they feel like they can access it. They feel like they can participate and have those discussions. Um, and so I really encourage you guys to, to check out those sort of scaffolded approach to start with surface, then go to deep and really think about increasing the ownership for the students along the way so that they can work well in teams. It's not magic, of course. Um, it's not, you, you know, don't, don't write to me, say, Julie, you said I was not gonna have problems working in teams, the kids working in teams, um, but it does really make a difference when we're intentional about them having the ownership. Thank you. Let's have one more question and then we'll move on and, and mention the people that won the raffle. Okay, great. Uh, so here's the last question. We are working hard to connect concepts from social studies to local communities and to problem solve approaches and, and to problem solving approaches. So I'm looking at the pyramid you share. Um, that would be the best part of transfer. Are there specific strategies to help us with this, to help us move social studies to local communities and the problem solving approach within our communities? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's, that's key. What, what we find, find in looking at Hattie's research is that problem-based learning, um, and we, talk, we do talk about it in the, in the first chapter, problem-based learning has a low effect size. And Hattie, Hattie his hypothesis is that we, we, do, we sort of throw them into the problem before they've acquired that surface level learning. And so if we've made sure that they acquire that surface level learning, then they're going to be able, and we, and we do the deep, we make sure they're sort of making those connections, then they're, that transfer to the community is going to be a lot more powerful for the students and so I would say definitely all the strategies apply in in the in the book that we have is going taking them intentionally through surface level strategies checking to monitor to make sure that they've got it moving to deep and moving to transfer that's going to really have an impact on your problem-based learning it's going to dramatically increase again that ownership and increase students ability to sort of say i see how what we're studying in class is related to this situation and then they start bringing in oh i saw this in the news um or i saw this project i have this idea i have this book they start bringing that in because they see how we're sort of structuring this particular um, unit or whatever it is that we're studying terrific thank you now I'd like to turn it over to Margaret O'Connor, uh, Margaret O'Connor in marketing from Corwin. To uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I think I think Julie, you're going to take this slide. So. Yeah, I just want to give a, a quick um, intro to this this book study idea. So we're gonna we're gonna do a book study, um, just three dates because it's a short book. It's five chapters, um, and so if you guys want to register, I'm going to be leading people through this book study. We'll look at chapters one and two on May 21st, chapters three and four on May 28th, and chapter four on June 4th. And um, I'm pretty sure my co-authors, we're going to have some guest appearances from my co-authors on a couple of those. So um, it's going to be fun. I hope that you guys will join us. There's the, the um, link there, bit.ly, and then it's case sensitive. So you want to put backslash capital V, capital L, capital SS, and then lowercase book club so that you can access the link to register for our book club completely free. Um, and the email that will go out after this will also have that link. Now I'll turn it over to Mark. <laughs> Yep, thank you, Julie. It's exciting to see the visible learning research now applied to the social studies discipline. Everyone will be receiving a recording of this webinar, a PDF of the slides, as well as Ju Julie mentioned the link to join her book study in an email that will be coming out in the next few days. Uh, just a reminder, visible learning for social studies will be hot off the press tomorrow, joining the suite of visible learning for literacy, mathematics, and science. You can order your copy on corwin.com with an everyday educator discount of 20% and free shipping with the code TESHIP. Or for instant delivery, you can also order an electronic version. Next slide. Julie is available for workshops on making sense of learning transfer, which is designed around her other Corwin titles tools for teaching conceptual understanding elementary and secondary which are supporting visible learning resources and last but not least our three random winners of the free copy of visible learning for social studies are Ange Tuddy, Melinda Johnson, and Gayla LeMay and we'll be in touch with you to get those books out to you and a big thank you to everyone for your participation tonight it was a great discussion. Thanks, Thanks Julie.